Welcome to the MPF webinar series, a series of quarterly one-hour panel discussions on important leadership topics. This program is presented by the Managing Partner Forum and moderated by John Remsen, Jr., CEO of the Managing Partner Forum and President of the Remsen Group. Additionally, we are proud to be presenting this initial webinar in affiliation with the Legal Marketing Association. During today's interactive session titled, What Every Managing Partner Needs to Know About Law Firm Marketing and Business Development, our panel of three legends in law firm marketing will discuss the hot issue of marketing and business development. If you have any questions for our panel, please feel free to type it in the chat box and we will answer as time allows. We'd like to remind you that today's session is recorded and will be archived on the Managing Partner Forum website. Thank you again for joining us. Over to you, John. Uh, of, uh, of a series of webinars we'll be presenting on topics of importance to law firm leaders, managing partners, and uh, so we've got about a hundred folks on the uh, line today, so we are glad you're here. I uh, want to especially thank uh, the Legal Marketing Association, and uh, it's real uh, uh, exciting to be presenting with them. We did a program uh, last month uh, featuring a panel of managing partners speaking to uh, LMA members and went very, very well, but it was the managing partner's perspective on marketing business development, how marketing folks can gain a seat at the table. So in this session, we're kind of flipping the tables and having some very seasoned uh, in-house law firm marketing professionals speak to managing partners uh, as to what they should know about marketing and business development. Uh, my, most of you guys know me. Uh, I run the Remsen Group as well as the Managing Partner Forum. I was in-house at a couple of law firms before uh, launching into a consultancy in the mid-90s. And I do a lot of speaking, uh, various organizations around the country. And uh, I was uh, as well a leader in LMA back in the day, uh, serving on the national board and as the first president of our southeastern chapter. Uh, as Dalen mentioned, we have a terrific panel with us this morning, and I will introduce them in alphabetical order. Uh, first, Jim Durham. Uh, Jim has held um, in-house marketing positions at uh, numerous uh, law firms, Littler, McGuire, Ropes and & Gray, and just recently he's joined Growth Play as its managing director. Uh, Jim's involved in LMA. He's a member of its Hall of Fame. Uh, Jim is a lawyer as well and has his mass, uh, law degree from Emory University here in Atlanta. So Jim, we're delighted to have you uh, with us today. Uh, joining Jim uh, is Adam Severson. And Adam is uh, the, a past president of the Legal Marketing Association. Uh, he currently serves as a CMO at Baker Donaldson based in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Adam has also been in-house at Fagri and Dorsey out of Minneapolis. Uh, Adam is a frequent speaker at Law Firm Networks, LMA, other organizations. Adam, delighted to have you with us. And last but certainly not least is uh, the incoming president of LMA, uh, Jill Weber. Uh, Jill is the CMO at Stinson Leonard Street based in Minneapolis where the air temperature today is what, minus six you were saying, Jill? It's uh, very chilly. So we're glad you came into the office to participate in the program. Uh, Jill has been with Fredrickson and Byron before joining Stinson Leonard Street. Uh, she is the president-elect, takes office uh, on the first of the year, and uh, numerous honors and awards uh, as, a, as a marketing professional, and uh, uh, went to the University of Minnesota. So we do have a great panel. And the way we're going to set this up is we've got an hour. And you all, as audience members, can type in some questions as we go. And uh, Dalen, why don't you walk us through how folks do that? Okay, great. You can just go to the chat box um, in your GoToMeeting window and type in the message. And then I will be watching it and um, make sure John gets the message. And as time allows, we will answer those questions. We'll keep an eye, but please uh, type in your questions as we go. We'll try to work some of those into our conversation. Uh, our uh, panel, we got together a couple of weeks ago, and as we sorted through the topics that we wanted to talk about, we've come up with about five or six areas. We want to spend, oh, eight, ten minutes uh, discussing in a very interactive format, um, and then uh, we'll work your questions in as, as the audience uh, as well and try to address those. Uh, so it's going to be a very interactive, somewhat spontaneous program. 
And uh, the first question I want to pose to Jill Weber, our incoming president at the Legal Marketing Association, and talking about major trends that we're seeing in terms of marketing, business development. Uh, what is going on out there? What trends are we seeing, Jill Weber? Thanks, John. We have seen a dramatic change in the law firm marketing and business development landscape over the past five years. I would say that's particularly been driven by the change in client demand. Uh, I've noticed a number of articles reporting on City Private Bank's most recent survey showing the significant overall drop in demand and as we see more work going in-house. So one of the first trends that we have been observing in the Legal Marketing Association is that it has gone from a seller's market to a buyer's market. And that was not just a temporary change related to the recession. It is a what we see to be a permanent change. We're also seeing more sophisticated buyers, the variety of models. So where traditionally you may have either worked with a private family business where perhaps uh, the lawyers are working with, they might have an in-house GC, but more often a CEO or perhaps CFO. If you're working in a major public company, Company, it might be a traditional in-house corporate legal department. We're now seeing the rise of a variety of in-house legal models, the traditional GC-driven um, in-house legal department, a legal operations department that might be driven by a COO who does not have a legal degree, who is very pricing and analytics-driven, or even further to procurement, where the buying decisions might be made by a centralized procurement department, not even a dedicated procurement group for a legal department, but procurement that handles everything from paper clips to lawyer hours. So that's been one significant change. Um, a second change that we've seen is a real emphasis on business development versus marketing. Uh, and I think you'll hear that from Jim and Adam and me throughout this call. Uh, in the beginning of legal marketing, certainly it was the advent of the ability to advertise. And so a lot of firms were spending time on branding and logos and ad campaigns and seminars and events. It's really much more of a one-to-one -one world now, which is it's all about the client relationship. And so, for example, coaching around business development, which I know both Adam and Jim do a great deal of, or training around business development um, key competencies is a big change. And for those who are on the call, um, I don't know how all of your legal or how your law firm marketing departments are structured, but really the balance of time, the majority of time should be focused on more of that business development coaching, understanding the clients, and being very business development focused. Those are just a couple that I would start with, John. I certainly saw these, see these trends out there as well, and I couldn't agree with you more, Jill. It is a people business. It's about relationships, friendships, reputation. And uh, you can't buy that stuff through marketing. You've got to go out and earn it. And I think FaceTime, you know, nothing replaces FaceTime. Uh, let me turn to you, Adam. A anything you might add to what Jill is talking about in terms of major trends in, uh, in the law firm marketing world? Thanks, John. One of the things that I would uh, build on what Jill was describing was a stronger uh, area of focus on industry-driven uh, marketing and business development. And, and really building out more significant uh, niche uh, practices where I think previously uh, being a, a strong litigator or a deal lawyer uh, was enough to either credential yourself or be considered on the short list. There's a, a far greater emphasis on the ability to position uh, yourself and identify unique characteristics uh, that we have. And so to that end, one example that I think is illustrative uh, of that is that you know many firms are doing what I call industry marketing. Uh, some firms um, are moving towards a um, industry practice management model and uh, and we have taken um, we're sort of continuing to dip our toe uh, in that here at Baker Donaldson uh, by way of uh, our healthcare group as well as our financial services group where it's not just marketing uh, that we do but the way in which we are uh, managing um, the practice and the substantive areas that our lawyers are um, expanding their representation uh, and, and their, their substantive expertise is much more industry focused uh, than it has been uh, historically. And we have been putting uh, more resources and time to the way in which we then go to market ourselves um, as experts uh, in that field. 
Adam, are you finding that this industry approach resonates with clients and prospective clients? Most definitely. Uh, people, people, you mentioned it being a people business. Uh, well, we, we serve people, but those people are in industries uh, inherently. And so, uh, as I mentioned, the, the need for us to be able to handle, um, let's say, litigation matters generally is very different than our ability to help an auto manufacturer with, uh, you know, dealer disputes or supplier litigation. And so as we hone our efforts and tout our representative matters in those instances, either on a, on a proactive marketing basis or in a, uh, in a in, in sort of a consultative, uh, you know, sales meeting, we really try to um, tell stories about our representation that, that really, and it really resonates um, with our clients. No, I think it's great about the industry model is it, it, it identifies our target audience. Uh, I, I remember when I, my first in-house position at a firm in Florida, uh, trying to market litigation. And I, I'm, I, I didn't know what I was doing and sitting down with the room full of litigators, you know, who's our target audience? Well, anybody involved in a dispute? <laughs> That's kind of hard to hit. But That's I think right. with industry focus, we really start to hone in on, on where we want to invest in relationships and reputation. Uh, one, other thing I, one other thing I just add, John, um, that, that builds on what Jill was describing was this notion of a, of a flat legal market and that we're competing both with in-house legal departments um, and the like. And so it's very much uh, a market share game. And so as, as firms um, continue to grow, conflicts obviously present themselves. So deepening the relationships that we have uh, with the clients that we have is of utmost importance. And, and most people, I think, intuitively um, get that. But one of the trends that, that um, we're acting upon and that we're, that, that we're seeing as well in the marketplace is a more intentional focus on those key clients. And by focus, not just, hey, we should work on those, but, um, but people and resources um, intended to solely focus on some of the more significant client relationships uh, in the firm. And so that's something that, that, that we've done uh, with, with a great deal of success as well as uh, a number of firms. And so having, you know, head counts on my department where their sole job is to, you know, work with our lawyers on developing specific client plans for a given client, um, orchestrating client teams, ensuring that we have FaceTime opportunities uh, with those clients uh, so that we can deliberately uh, and meaningfully expand and, and, and secure and maintain those relationships. I think, I think that's excellent advice. I think before firms get wound up and going after new clients, let's take darn good care of what we got uh, for a whole slew of reasons. Uh, Jim, let me turn to you and, and ask what you see going on out there in terms of, of trends and um, adding on to what Adam and Jill are, are describing. Uh, excuse me, I would emphasize the last point that uh, Adam made there. I, I think there's just nothing more important and firms are catching on to the importance of paying very close attention and getting closer to clients. Two others I'll just mention but not explain because they could take up far too much time. One is a much more professional, rigorous approach to RFPs. Obviously, as competition is increasing, more firms are more companies are issuing them. I am seeing firms get much more serious about preparation and in a strategic approach. It's no longer at all possible to just throw together the last one and change the name and, and expect to win. Um, we call it a growth by trying to leave a mark, and firms are really working hard to try to leave a mark. And then the other thing I'll mention is innovation. It's a buzzword in so many ways, and yet it's real. Firms are actually investing money and time in trying to develop alternative ways of doing basic work. And there's, there's no escaping the fact that a lot of firms are going to have to partner with outside technology companies to provide services that have been done by the lawyers historically, and that, that's emerging too. Yeah, there's, there's lots going on out there. I think we've identified some of the big ones. And, um, you know, that shift from marketing Wow. From, from marketing to business development is a, is a huge one, and I see more and more firms hiring directors of business development in addition to their director of marketing, 
really working with those lawyers on their rainmaking skills and uh, and getting them out there uh, developing relationships and reputation. Um, let's move on to the next area we decided we wanted to chat about and uh, get a lot of background noise here. Um, and that's, you know, the, the amount of time, the amount of money a law firm should be investing in its marketing and business development program. And um, I'll, I think uh, we decided, Adam, you'd be our primary uh, panelist to respond to this. How much time, how much money should, and, and keep, keep it, you know, geared toward mid-sized commercial firms, since that's most of our audience today. Uh, how much should a firm be investing in its marketing and business development, Adam? Sure. Well, the, the, the short answer is probably more uh, than they currently are. Uh, the, the longer answer is, uh, it, is it depends. Uh, it depends on the nature of practice. Uh, it depends on the industries that you serve and the makeup uh, of your law firm. Uh, I would typically uh, recommend that uh, a given lawyer, presumably after their third year, of practice would be spending roughly 200 hours uh, per year on client development efforts. Um, and the, in that time, the time that they spend will, and the activities that they would employ upon would really depend on, you know, the, how tenured uh, they are. So for example, if you're more junior in your career, uh, you may spend uh, a fair bit of time working on credentialing. Uh, and awareness building efforts uh, and expanding uh, your network. And if you're a more senior partner, you may spend a lot more of your time on, you know, building and deepening um, your existing relationships and focusing on, focusing on um, client expansion efforts. Um, you know, that number is not necessarily prescribed. I know, uh, I know many lawyers who um, think that 50 hours is, is more than they should spend. Uh, I also know uh, a number of very successful lawyers that spend three to four hundred hours uh, a year and, and still maintain a very uh, heavy practice. Um, another, uh, a couple other ways to look at time and money uh, in this space is from a from an infrastructure and departmental perspective. And um, most industry research would say that um, having uh, one uh, marketing and business development uh, full time equivalent, uh, one headcount for every 20 to 25 attorneys is a uh, good uh, is a good measure um, for the infrastructure that you might need. Um, the, what those individuals do and how um, how they are um, how they are structured really varies uh, on the firm and the efforts and culture um, of that firm. But so if you're a, a firm of 100 attorneys, you should have um, anywhere between four and five people uh, on your marketing staff. And then if you play those numbers out. Um, up or down. Uh, that's typically the way that that would play out. And then um, similar uh, industry research uh, would say um, that anywhere between two to four percent of annual revenues uh, should be spent on client development. Um, I've seen, uh, uh, I know uh, a small number of firms that are greater um, than four percent, but I'd say uh, industry averages between uh, two and, and four percent. Yeah, that's the benchmark we, we've, we've uh, kind of been talking about for a long, long time. And uh, that's, we do a survey of in-house of, uh, of mid-sized law firms asking what percentage of revenue do you invest. It, it holds true, 2 to 4 percent. Uh, we did find this year, however, about 25 percent of mid-sized firms report investing more than 4 percent. Uh, and that's exclusive of salaries in your marketing department. So uh, I agree with you, Adam. More is probably a good answer. Uh, I, can't, I can tell you, I work with a lot of 50, 75 lawyer firms that have one in-house marketer. I work with 30, 40 lawyer firms that have no in-house marketer. And uh, you give them this data. And uh, Eva Wisnick in New York, for example, surveys the M-Law 100, finds that staffing level at one in-house marketer for every 23 lawyers. Uh, show them the benchmarking data. If you're a marketer looking for more staff, you know, show them this men benchmarking data, what other firms are doing. Jill, um, what would you recommend? Uh, would you agree with Adam, uh, what he sets forth in terms of time and money or anything to add? You see things differently. 
I agree with what Adam said, and I would add to it by um, noting that I think it's really important to measure return on investment. It's not just the benchmarks are very important in terms of staff and also some of the financial ratios that Adam shared. But where you are spending your money, it's important to have a rigorous analysis around how it's producing a return or not producing a return. So as one example here at our firm, we created a business development training program called Fast Forward. And we've done that program enough that we can say we invest X in business development coaches to work one-on-one -on -one with our attorneys. And we can measure by creating revenue goals for each of the participants in the program. We can measure did they achieve the goals or not, and then how did their practice grow as compared to their peers. And over the years, we've been able to say those who participate in the program on average, not this is like a disclosure for, um, for a mutual fund, not all, you know, not everyone's going to have the same return on investment, but on average, those in the program have growth rates eight to ten times that of their peers. So that, in that way, we know it's working. Another example would be an industry conference. If you're sending someone to an industry conference, you could measure did they come back with contacts or not, or if you have a seminar, how many key clients attended, how many prospects attended, how many prospects were converted into clients. Using those metrics of ROI, I think, is one of the most critical components. It's not just what you put in, it's what you're measuring as an output. Yeah, I think firms are paying more and more attention to that. Uh, Jim Durham, anything to add? Just the idea that's been said in different ways, it's much more about how you spend your time and money than it is about how much time and money. You can spend 500 hours a year just writing treatises or articles and and that's your marketing time. That's not without value, but there's all of your time and then some. Or you could spend uh, 50 hours writing important thought leadership and, and 100 meeting, as Adam said, face to face with clients and prospects. So I, I think you know, research hasn't been mentioned. Investing in competitive research and client re industry research, that's an expense that should be growing at every firm. And, uh, and then finally, with time, um, one of the most important issues we've talked about is client maintenance and client growth. A lawyer who's managing key clients should allocate significant time to client care. And that client care should be considered important sales and marketing time because it will result in increased revenue. And, I won't go into the stats, but you can imagine clients that are tended to grow faster than clients that are not tended to. Funny how that works. Yeah. Uh, funny how that works. Uh, before we leave this topic, and, and Adam, since you kicked us off here, do you think every lawyer at the firm has a role to play in marketing and business development? Absolutely. Uh, the, to, in my view, the days of uh, service partners, if you will, are, are going uh, by the wayside. Certainly, there will be individuals that have a um, higher level of emphasis and, and deeper, sort of better, more profitable uh, relationships. But to think that um, you know somebody can sort of just sit and, and churn uh, churn legal work, I think is is not not part of a long-term viability uh, of a firm. And also keeping in mind that, uh, to me, client service is a key function of the uh, marketing and business development uh, program uh, for any of our client relationships. And inherently, then, anybody that's touching a file, including legal secretaries and the receptionist, uh, the person uh, at the, on the marketing team that greets them when they come to a breakfast briefing program, all that is part of the overarching client experience. Uh, and so to think that uh, that you know people can be removed from that, I think is is misguided. Um, one thing I wanted to build on, John, just for a second, you mentioned that you know of a number of uh, firms with you know fifty attorneys or seventy attorneys with one marketing professional. And given the number of managing partners on the line today, uh, one of the things that I think would be a tough question for you to ask yourself is if you're setting uh, whoever that person is. Um, up for success. Uh, I'm, you know, with a larger firm and, and have a, a larger team, and so uh, as I've talked, have I spoken to managing partners over the years? Sometimes they share with me um, their frustrations about uh, the uh, inability for uh, their marketing professionals to move the needle. And I think that um, if you have such a uh, significant uh, or such a lack of investment in people support, 
um, for that individual. It's inherently, you know, they are pulled in so many uh, different directions uh, that, that there's no chance for them uh, to succeed in a really meaningful way because if you think through the course of a day of any individual, everything from, you know, printing name tags to ordering the chicken um, for the program to then going in the back end of the content management system to update um, some bios that are, that are done to working on an RFP, um, all of those, the, the myriad of tasks that um, get executed in a given day or a given week uh, really dilute um, the, uh, that individual's ability to do anything impactful. And so I do think that that's just something I wanted to impress upon those uh, folks because they shared with me their frustrations and at the same time, um, you know, these people, you know, in some instances are, you know, killing themselves and, and they similarly are frustrated by their uh, inability to uh, move the ball forward. You know, I, what I found, I agree with everything you say here, Adam, and, and, and I agree. I think every lawyer has a role to play. Everybody doing different things that they're good at, that they enjoy. Uh, not everybody doing the same things. Um, should we be tracking this time? You know, I often said that the, the, my, my biggest enemy is an in-house marketer and trying to get lawyers to get out there and invest in marketing and business development was that darn billable hour. And given a choice between a billable hour and a non-billable hour, the lawyer is going to pick the billable hour every time. Uh, should this time be better valued through tracking, rewards, incentives? And Adam, I'll ask you that question. Should there be tracking of the incentives relative to their time? Should non-billable time be tracked, measured, rewarded? Uh, I, I definitely think it should be tracked. Um, you know, we we track that time. We look at the overall investment in a given uh, lawyer's uh, time, including uh, pro bono hours, including uh, practice management uh, hours, and that, that practice management time really builds on what Jim was describing relative to innovation. Uh, the, the incentives of how they uh, spend that time I think really vary uh, on the culture of the law firm. Uh, you know, I've been in, in some firms where, you know, client development uh, like here, is, it's an expectation. Uh, and so then to incent that behavior seems a little bit counter to the culture where something uh, is an expectation. I've been elsewhere where you know, I feel like we've been pulling teeth to try to get people to, you know, go on, uh, go on client meetings. And so I think the, the incentives um, would be more a function of the culture of the firm. And so, you know, if, if you have a culture where client development is an expectation, then I think an incentive is already baked into the compensation system. Okay. John, can I, take, can I take a shot at that? Because Absolutely. I think that actually is one of the uh, golden nuggets, if you will, of, of a program like this. If, if people go back to their firms or if you're a managing partner and you go to your firm and you say somebody pull together all of the non-billable time that's been recorded, 95% of firms never look at it, nobody pays attention to it, but they require eight hours or seven hours a day. If you, record, if you add up your average hourly rate times the all of the non-billable time that's booked, it is a staggering number in every firm. And for an AMLA 100 firm, it's literally a hundred million, uh, for a firm with six hundred million dollars of revenue, it's five, it's a hundred million dollars. Who in the world would run a business and not pay attention to a hundred million dollars worth of inventory? And if you're a small firm, and it's, you know, it's Thirty-eight mil, uh, thirty-eight million dollars. You're a hundred and twenty million dollar firm. Who would not pay attention to thirty-eight million dollars of inventory? If what most firms are basing their billings on are hours, you've got to be finding, seeing how people are using hours when they're in their professional environment. Now you get. So I, I say that because in several firms we set up a meaningful non-billable time category. You, there's usually thirty-eight options. There should be three. It's client care, it's prospecting, and it's general marketing or general business development. Client care per client. And if you only have three categories and people record what they actually do, now it's strategic. 
you can actually see this is what that person is doing with their time. I'm stopping here because I could go on for an hour on this. I just I, think I, it's you know, I'm with you. I find a lot many firms reluctant to reward the non-billable time because of the lack of accountability. Uh, right. We can fudge that. The dollars coming in the door, we can count that. Yep. Uh, but but the marketing time, going to church, going to grocery store, this you know, some lawyers, if you're not watching them closely, will count that as marketing time. And so the accountability, and I think this is a nice segue into our next topic, which is individual marketing plans. And some document that holds folks accountable to what they're supposed to be doing uh, and against which that time is tracked. Um, and on individual plans, uh, I'm a proponent, uh, but Jim, we uh, designated you to be our first panelist to speak to individual plans. And what are your feelings? Do they work? Should firms have these? I think any, anybody who's serious about growing their practice and, and growing their clients and keeping their clients should have a plan of some kind. I have seen almost none work because of the point you made a moment ago. As there's really no accountability. If somebody's got their hours in and they're, they're, they're contributing uh, to the firm in other ways and, and practicing good law, the fact that they um, didn't actually follow through on their plan Half the time it doesn't get looked at. Do I do I have a, an alternative or a suggestion? Well, first of all, I do think that having some recognition, not re reward, it's not billable time, but having the accountability for non-billable time, it starts to not, it starts to be strategic because people can look at it and say you're not spending your time in the right way. So it, the part of it is is could could be fixed with planning, but the other part is is it needs to be practical. I've seen comprehensive detailed plans that the lawyers spend hours filling filling out and, and, and it's not you in my judgment most of it's not useful in the sense that it's 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 not practical I think it should almost be more like a dashboard which clients am I committed to grow this year that I serve right now which clients do I have in the prospects do I have in the pipeline that I want to convert to clients this year and I'm going to prioritize those in which, uh, where, which practices could my expertise be cross-sold and uh, who am I going to talk to about trying to bring some of the expertise in my group into that industry team? Having, I have, you know, if we're international, for which clients do we not do international work that I think we should where I have some responsibility? That plan starts to look like a dashboard and you can change, you know, you can move up and to the right. Okay, now I've added international work to two of the ten clients I serve. Okay, I've now cross sold into or out of. Um, so I think it's it, by end of the day, it's about accountability, and the firm can either hold people accountable to, to these plans or not. A lot of ambitious lawyers do them on their own. Yes, hello. A lot of rainmakers have their plans, but it's in their head. And I think the idea of putting it in writing and sharing with others so we can learn, you know, how our rainmakers develop this big book of business, uh, you know, yeah. just doesn't happen. It, you work hard. Uh, a lot of non-billable time to build a book of business. Uh, Jill, what's your what's your thinking on individual plans? Are you a proponent? I'm a huge proponent of the plans um, with the right metrics built in and with the right accountability to Jim's point. So as part of the fast forward program I mentioned, we created a business plan template where to me there are two critical components. One is a very specific and tangible revenue goal. And I think we often in, if you look at most partner engagement plans, it's grow, you know, they, they put down the same thing over and over again. This client, I want to grow at X amount, as opposed to what kind of revenue do I want? That's a more sales-oriented approach to it, and it may make people uncomfortable, but it does force them to go outside their comfort zone. The other part beyond revenue is, I think, an actual goal that they have that they're passionate about for their practice. So. I've talked to many partners who can remember the day when they were young associates or even young partners where they said, I no longer want to get assignments from X, whoever X was, the partner who was the dominant person in that practice. They just got tired of taking the assignments and so autonomy was really their objective. Or a young female associate I worked with who said, I want to be a mining lawyer. She's built her entire practice around that because she's passionate around it. It isn't just the revenue, it's an industry focus. So I think those two components are really critical to the plan to make them work. The last thing I would add to Jim's good point on accountability is there's a great 
slide that, we, I don't know where I got this, it was from a, a consultant who spoke once, it's called Implementing a Good Idea, and it's based on a BYU study. And it says 10% of people who hear a good idea will do something about it, 25% will do something with it if they think in depth about it. 40% will do something if they prepare a plan. So if you do business development training and you just give them a little bit of information, they're probably not going to do anything with it. That's the 10%. But if they write a plan, 40% are more likely to do it. 50% will do something with it if they add time to the plan. 60% will do something with it if another person is asked to be involved, i.e. an LAA, a legal administrative assistant. And then finally, 90% will do something with it if there is a date set up to follow up with the other person. And that's what aligns best with formal business development coaching. And, and there's that accountability. No doubt. Adam, anything to add on individual plans before we leave this topic? I think uh, just, just two pieces. So the plans, the, the template structures that we work from have uh, both strategic considerations uh, and, and then tactical considerations. And so at a strategic level, we try to have them think through um, where they get their, their work from. Um, logistically, sometimes that's more internal sources than it is external sources. And so to, to Jill's comment about kind of who's providing them assignments, we ask them to think through that. We also ask about where they ideally would like to see their practice go. Uh, and then we, we look to develop, um, you know, tactical considerations in the sort of blocking and tackling of the execution of that plan. You know, which clients are they going to see? What type of market awareness activities are they going to be involved with? Um, what industry... Uh, organizations uh, have their target market, uh, you know, as part of that. And then the other piece that I would just add, and I know that, that Jill's firm um, does this relative to the revenue goals, as we set them, I think frequently they're somewhat arbitrary. Um, and, and not that her firm's goals are arbitrary, that's not what I was intending, but that the, the goal setting piece is more so, you know, 10% higher working attorney collections or billing attorney collections than the prior year. And what it takes into less account is, let's say you're an intellectual property attorney and you want to have a 10% or 20% increase in your book of business. And if you look at, if you break that down, um, what that may mean is that you need to do 13 more mid-level patent applications at a fixed fee of, you know, $7,500 a piece. So then the next question inherently is, where are you going to get those files from? And so to get specific either by um, a number of matters based on a fixed fee approach, if you have that kind of uh, ability within your given practice, or to talk about a specific number of matters um, in a litigation context or real estate or, or otherwise, and then trying to assign that to a client because then you start to align the dollars with the activities that your plan has in place, which is which is an uncomfortable level of specificity that some of our lawyers uh, get to because once they put that to paper, we then start asking them about it. Um, but then it also ensures that the activities that people are uh, taking on are more aligned with their ability to really drive that revenue figure. Okay, excellent. I, you know, my observation, plan, I'm a proponent of plans like I think we all are, but there has to be accountability to it. And uh, I, I see a lot of smaller, mid-sized firms. We're going to have individual plans. Everybody fills in the template. They give it to Joe, never to be seen again. And so that didn't work, well, the skeptics will say. Uh, but if we're going to go through this individual planning process, somebody has to review them, approve them, fund them, and hold people accountable to them. Um, and, and I like the idea of monthly marketing meetings, where we gather around, we share each other's plans, we coordinate what we're doing, playing off each other's strengths. But if you've got to show up at a meeting every month and report on what you've done to advance your plan, there's a good chance you may have done some things to, uh, to, to move the ball. Uh, planning without implementation is a missed opportunity, and uh, I think you've got to have that accountability element to that. Uh, another mechanism I like to suggest firms consider, we're not going to fund any of your marketing until we have a plan on file. 
spend <coughs> the firm's resources and we want to make sure these, these, these resources are being allocated uh, in, in, in a good way, uh, consistent with firm goals and objectives as well as your strengths and interests. So enough about marketing planning. Here's something we're seeing more and more of and it ties into the kind of the shift from marketing to business development and that's sales training for lawyers. Uh, more and more firms are uh, bringing on people to work with their lawyers and help them develop their rainmaking skills. And uh, uh, Adam, why don't you lead us off? What What are you seeing in sales training? What do you recommend in this area? Yeah, well, well we actually um, do a, uh, I guess, a homegrown uh, program here at Baker Donaldson. Um, I've developed um, a pitch workshop that really focuses on a um, consultative team-based approach uh, to client development uh, based on my experience and work with um, clients over the last 15 plus years and and and, and then I serve as the uh, instructor um, for that uh, for that program and it includes um, some mock um, client development pitch pitches in which we um, use a couple uh, outside resources for um, you know, we also have done a uh, sort of a training and coaching uh, program with a cadre, anywhere between 10 to 15 attorneys, that has both a substantive approach and then uh, individual coaching uh, as part of that. Um, and I've either participated in or, or I guess, experienced a number of other uh, coaching and sales training programs over the years, but right now we're, we're focusing most of our effort on uh, these pitch workshops uh, and then we also do a fair bit of uh, additional um, client development training that is more of a what I would call a learn on demand mm -hmm. um, type uh, offering. So we have a, a Baker 5 um, program which is a series of videos that are the top five things that uh, any lawyer needs to know in less than five minutes. Um, and that is broken down both by um, practice area and industry, so the top five things you need to know about our healthcare practice or the top five things that you need to know about our financial services transactions practice. Again, all in, in sort of bite-sized chunks, um, if you will. And then there's also um, sort of a market-specific, uh, or not market-specific, I'm sorry, a activity-specific uh, Baker 5 videos that really hit on the top five things that you need to know about, you know, uh, networking at a conference. And so it's, you know, training on sort of marketing tips um, that way. And then another, I guess I don't know if I'd call it necessarily sales training, but we have another offering that's called our Marketing Minute um, that is as it sounds. It is uh, tips and tricks. Um, by either lawyers or members of my team or, or myself that are videos that we develop that's basically um, just a one minute excerpt on a particular topic and so in some instances it might be tips to setting um, a goal setting meeting with one of your clients at the beginning um, of a new year. Uh, it might be having proactive conversations about alternative fee agreements. It might be teeing up a conversation about legal project management. And so, uh, or it also might be, you know, ensuring that you have um, the the right links and an updated biography, um, you know, within your bio. And so, we try to keep, you know, through those various activities, really try to keep many of our efforts uh, top of mind. You know, this is the stuff they don't teach in law school, and and our surveys suggest uh, about forty percent of mid-sized firms claim to be providing sales training to their lawyers. I don't believe it. I, I think the number is lower than that. Uh, but the soft skills that they don't teach you in law school, leadership is another area where I think firms should be investing in leadership training for their young lawyers as well. And very, very few mid-sized firms are doing that. Uh, Jill, what say you uh, regarding training and uh, business development training? So a couple of observations. One, I think experiential training is really critical. So I think Adam's uh, pitch workshop is brilliant because it's actually getting people to have to role play. And if you look at adult learning, it isn't just this static, I'm going to sit there. And certainly if you look at millennials, 
they want to be spoken to in the way that Adam has developed with you know brief synopsis. It is the YouTube generation, so leveraging different ways to communicate it as opposed to just we're going to bring everybody in a room. So I think you know having that experiential option is really critical. A second piece I would say is group accountability, which John I think you referred to earlier. Right. Excuse me again, back to our fast forward group, what we found is if you get a group of sort of similar young partner peers together and they have to report to one another on their business development plans on a quarterly basis in person, number one, it fosters building of trust and facilitates cross-selling in that way, and second, they are more personally committed to implementing the plan because they don't want to look stupid in front of their peer group. Um, and I think third, it's really just that individual, it's got to be at the individual level because everybody has a different motivation, everybody has a different style and way that they're going to approach it. So it is one size fits one. And Jim? A uh, couple of things. We're all saying training, but I think we're also all saying and, and adding the coaching component because that, that is definitely critical. Uh, and so, yeah, I think there's an, an, an increase across firms in uh, sales training and coach, combined with coaching. But I also think that it's important to not forget that while sales techniques and methodologies are valuable and critical, I think Adam said this earlier, service is still the single greatest differentiator among firms at the end of the day, how they are served. And so to combine service, client service training with sales training to me is, is critical. And that brings us to the final point I'd make on this, which is I'm seeing a real shift to lawyers wanting to be more authentic, to bring a more genuine attitude of, of literally gratitude and, and authenticity to their practice. So if you could combine the training with the idea that lawyers should not put their humanity aside and, and bring it forward in these relationships, I'm seeing greater receptivity to that. And it goes to um, a blog I just did on selling with heart. So if anybody wants to see that, it's on growth play. Uh, I could agree with you. Authenticity is so important. People see right through a phony. Uh, really important. You've got to be passionate about what you're doing. We do have a question here from uh, one of our participants in Connecticut. Uh, where can I find a business development coach? <laughs> you can answer that, John? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, there are plenty of them out there. And um, uh, now that we do some of this work. Uh, Bill Flannery is probably a pioneer. He runs the WJF Institute out of Austin, Texas. You can send some people out there. Uh, there are plenty of folks doing this. And um, if you want to contact us offline, Carol Francis, uh, happy to, happy to uh, give you a short list of folks who do this type of work. Uh, another question before we move on to our next topic um, it is re regarding networks. You know, the law firm networks. There are many, many, many of them out there. They seem to be popping up every day. Uh, what's your assessment on uh, these law firm networks? And Jill, I'll start with you. I think it depends on the firm and what their existing platform is and what some of the needs of their clients are. So if you have a client, if you have a number of clients that have really a national presence and you're primarily either state-based or in a very small region, the law firm networks can be incredibly beneficial because you can collaborate and serve the needs of those clients across multiple jurisdictions. The other thing that I've found, and we belong to a network, is the dependability of a state referral. So in the case, if a client calls and says, and we don't have a, an office in South Carolina. Who can we work with in South Carolina? We know for sure that um, the Terralux member firm in South Carolina will be a good resource and whoever we contact there, who's our point of contact, will call and respond promptly. And that is incredibly meaningful to your point and the theme that's been reiterated throughout this whole webinar. Client service is paramount. So if you can respond to a client quickly without having to go, well, I have to go find it. I'm going to send an email to all my partners to see who has a law firm resource in South Carolina, then you're not being as responsive as, as if you have a network. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we, we asked a mid-sized firm, we did a survey back in April, uh, 147 mid-sized firms. Among the questions we asked was, are you a member of a law firm network? About 40% of mid-sized firms report to be a member of a network. And I think, Jill, your point was spot on. And Jim, uh, the idea is to better serve your existing clients. You got them covered anywhere on the planet. Um, I was doing a podcast with the chair of Meritas talking about, you know, why should a law firm want to be in a network? And his number one point was to better serve existing clients, not to generate inbound referrals. 
but do your due diligence like anything. You really check these groups out. Find the right one. Once you do, you got to plug in, get active uh, if you expect to get much out of it. So uh, do the due diligence. Find the right one. Plug in. Um, let's move on. Uh, I'm looking at the clock here, and we're starting to near the top of the hour. Um, and uh, we wanted to talk a little bit here about where you guys see firms wasting marketing money and time. Um, and let me, let's see, who did we say was going to respond to that one? That's a Jill Weber topic. Where do you see law firms wasting money in the name of marketing and business development, Jill? Well, I'd say there's a couple of areas. One is back to the earlier conversation about individual marketing plans. And when we got down, I, I thought Adam did such a great job of summarizing. It's not just how you want to have these revenues or these types of clients, but what are the specifics? How many of these kinds of matters do you need to get and who are the clients you're going to get them from? So any marketing activities that aren't tied directly back to an individual or practice industry plan is a waste of money. It just is. There's got to be some reason why you're doing it. This random acts of lunch, or I'm just going to have drinks with this person that I've known forever. It's not a good use of money. Another area I'd say is um, letting people go to industries or conferences without a very thoughtful plan. They are an incredible investment of both money and time. So if they're gone for two days and they spend $3,000 on hotel and airfare, and, and they come home with a an expense report that says basically, I had lunch by myself, dinner by myself, breakfast by myself, or worse, I attended with my spouse, but I'm only charging the firm for my half of the meals. A managing partner should reject those expense reimbursement requests. Well, here's what I see. You send a lawyer out to a conference, and they're busy. They're up in their room, quote, working, unquote. That means billing. Uh, and they're not out at the reception or the coffee break. Uh, what are they doing there if <laughs> they're sitting in the hotel room, quote, working? Um, uh, yeah. Um, Jim, do you see firms squandering resources uh, in certain areas? Right. And if so, where? I would just, uh, one word, sponsorships. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll add a word, unmanaged. It's a lot of what Joel's saying. Just 5,000 every year for this event, maybe somebody goes, maybe they don't, maybe they engage, maybe they don't. You multiply that times 10, 50 to 100 events. Again, you've got limited resources and because a lawyer has always felt this is important for us to have a presence there, but they don't really have a presence there. They've just put their name on some signs and uh, I, I really believe that that's an area where you could shift money quickly from sponsorships to client-facing activities. And forgive me for my voice, those of you who know me, I'm obviously a little under the weather here. Yeah, you, sound, you. A little, you sound a little stuffed up today, yeah. Jim. Sorry to hear yeah. that. Big time. Uh, Adam, are you seeing firms uh, wasting dollars? Well, we've really gone uh, to, to echo uh, Jim and, and Jill's sentiment. We've really done a strategic analysis of uh, the sponsorships that that we're involved in. Uh, there's nothing actually, you know, I think there's some unintended consequences that can occur if you don't fulfill uh, a sponsorship well. So many of the sponsorships allow you to, you know, put your logo on, you know, on the, the rotating PowerPoint display or on the brochure or the materials for an industry conference. But many of them are for, uh, for a table for some kind of gala um, or lunch meeting or, or whatnot. And there's nothing worse than having your firm's name um, at the center of, a, of an event and not having anybody sitting at that table. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think people sometimes are more interested to kind of appease a client request uh, to let them, you know, to say, oh, your favorite pet charity, here's $1,500 and we get that table. And they're not necessarily thinking through you know what it's going to look like when nobody shows up, um, and actually the it has a, a more detrimental effect than um, you know trying to simply uh, support uh, those efforts. I think there's there's other you, you know areas that you know we've been trying to evaluate and looking at you know for example our advertising spend um, and you know I think the the value of 
whether it's electronic or print advertising and thinking through, again, I think it's also thinking through what yields the highest return on investment, but one of the things that Jim said is ensuring that you've got a strong pipeline of efforts um, across, uh, across the firm uh, to make sure that you're not you know, solely doing client visits at the uh, exclusion of market awareness activities, but that you're really trying to invest uh, in, in all of those. And then, you know, depending on the evolution of where you're situated, um, we found that being really strategic with the investment that we do um, and, and, and narrowly focused on, you know, the, the directories that we participate in is something else that, that we've been really, again, evaluating and focusing on it and trying to determine what makes the most sense. You know, I think every in-house marketer can relate to filling the table. <laughs> um, we're well intended when we make the commitment, but uh, it's amazing how the lawyers fall off like flies as we get closer and closer to the big event and uh, we end up scrambling around just to get warm bodies there. I'm going to throw out an area where I see a lot of firms squandering marketing dollars. Martindale Hubble. I think Martindale is irrelevant and uh, I have find firms that have dropped their listing find little uh, negative reaction to it. Uh, I think there are better ways to spend that money uh, than throwing it at Martindale Hubble and other directories uh, that nobody really cares much about. Uh, so we'll leave that topic. I always get in trouble when I start to uh, uh, going in on the directories, but uh, many of them are playing to lawyer ego and uh, clients aren't referencing them as they do their due diligence to find and select outside counsel. Uh, last issue I thought we'd talk about, given that we have uh, many managing partners on the line, is what is their role in implementing an effective marketing and business development program? And Jim, I'll turn to you. Uh, in this last area we wanted to explore, the role of the managing partner. Well, I think as we mentioned in our practice run, um, there are a, there is a wide range of uh, behaviors, if you will, across managing partners. Some are hands-on with almost everything. Some are brilliant delegators. I think all that really matters is that client, the client experience and client growth and revenue growth is front and center, and then what they what they can do to encourage every constituency in the firm to contribute to client growth and client and revenue growth and client satisfaction. So I think in their role they have to be actively involved in everything that touches the client experience. That's from intake and billing to client feedback at the uh, end of any engagement or relationship. And if I don't get to say anything else on this uh, call because it's getting tight, I will end with, I do believe they should be actively involved in ensuring the firm is getting honest, objective feedback from their top clients. I agree. Managing partners, go visit your firm's top clients and show them the love and thank them and uh, ask how we doing and how we can improve. Leave the billing attorneys at home uh, and have a good candid conversation with the firm's top clients. I think that's really, really important. Jill, would you add anything to what a managing car partner can and should be doing uh, to uh, reinforce a firm's marketing program? So two things I would say. One is exactly what Jim said, which is be outward facing and meet with key clients. Second, internally, it's important to fly the flag and communicate the importance of client focus. And part of that is being a supporter of your marketing professional. I'd highly recommend if you have a marketing professional on your staff and that person has credibility with your attorneys and has good ideas, which I'm sure they all do, give them a seat at the table, bring them to board meetings, bring them to executive committee meetings so that they can get to know what is going on within the firm and they can have that voice. It is really critical to their ability to get the job done and to have the credibility to get the job done. That is great advice. And Adam? Uh, you know, I think I think Jill and and Jim really hit on uh, many of the the things that I would that I would say is to just ensure that um, you're both supportive and if if there's feedback that you have 
um, for those professionals to provide it um, and to ensure that you're really honing in on client-focused uh, activities in, in both outwardly but also to ensure that there's um, inherent um, coordination. Sometimes I call it forced coordination uh, and from time to time we'll need to get some of the firm's leadership uh, involved in some of those client efforts to make sure that we're keeping the client's interests um, at, the, at the, the forefront of what we're trying to do. Excellent. The managing partners definitely should be a champion of marketing. Uh, Jill, we, I had asked our panel to contribute articles and uh, checklists and such, and we did put together a nice set of handout material. And if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that, um, we've got the PowerPoint deck, our faculty bios, as well as a number of articles and contributions from our panel. Good stuff in there. Um, Jill also mentions these resources. Go check these out. Uh, Jill, you want to speak to any of them specifically or uh, just encourage people to check those out? Yes, I encourage you to check them out. The one topic we didn't address in terms of the trends is artificial intelligence and there's some things that law firms are doing that are quite innovative to take commoditized services and make them accessible via technology that every managing partner should keep an eye on. Excellent. Thank you for providing these resources panel and we're at the top of the hour and I do want to thank our panel. I think you guys did a great job. Here are their contact information and I would think that each of them would entertain a, a call or an email uh, from anyone on our panel uh, or for any, anyone on our call today. So please uh, don't hesitate to reach out, contact our faculty if uh, uh, a point you want to discuss in a bit more detail. So Jim, Adam, Jill, thank you so much uh, for uh, what I thought was a, a very rich and uh, high-level conversation about marketing and business development. Uh, finally, um, we want your feedback. We're going to send you guys um, a, a post a webinar um, uh, email. Please uh, tell us what you thought. We'll have an electronic survey set up. We'll get through to that and give us your input. This is our first uh, first webinar out the blocks, so your input is particularly important uh, as to how we can improve these programs going forward. Here's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to us as well if we can help in any way. Uh, thank you for attending our program, and let me kick it back to you, Dale and Courtney. What a great session. Thanks so much for your participation. And as we mentioned before, these sessions are recorded and will be archived on the NPF website at managingpartnerforum.org. Thank you again for your attendance this afternoon and have a fantastic day. Thanks everybody. Thank you, panel. Thank, Thank you. you.